Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Uh, I've had to dig and live in foxholes for periods of time. I'm not sure I'd want to share one with Professor Tantor because nobody would get any sleep in that foxhole. We'd be in there talking and arguing the whole time, uh, but Ray's a great friend and a great policymaker. Uh, as some of you know, my family's got a, uh, an important Iran connection. My father, who was a Green Beret officer, was uh, stationed over there in Shiraz in uh, 1975, 76, 77 time frame. Uh, and as a result of that, and he, w he was a Farsi speaker, he greatly enjoyed his time. In fact, it was hard to get him back from Iran, frankly. Um, uh, I grew up in a house full of Iranian things and Iranian friends and Farsi and great Nowruz celebrations and everything else that goes along with it. So it's great to be, to get a chance to touch uh, that community again. Now, 30 years uh, after my father worked in Iran, I worked on uh, political military issues concerning Iran in the Bush administration, and among our initiatives uh, I created was a thing called the Gulf Security Dialogue, and we created it to be an overarching framework for security cooperation in, in the Gulf region. And the intent of that program was to have a framework for defense cooperation that would have the effect of strengthening uh, regional confidence in the U.S. and its staying power in the Gulf, and in helping our friends in the region uh, stand firm against Iranian aggression and interference. And I'll talk a little bit about that today and where that and the related security efforts stand. Uh, that's my field, after all, uh, that was my job. And the policy issues I dealt with were fundamentally about geopolitical power and security issues, very traditionally defined, and more specifically about the balance of power in the Gulf. Uh, but let me say here at the outset that though even if I weren't a security professional, I still think that the U.S. as a whole needs to measure and evaluate its Iran policy against the standard of how it is dealing with Iran as a strategic challenge. I believe this is the most important prism, although not the only one, uh, by which to frame and judge our Iran policies. Uh, other U.S. foreign policy professionals in both parties and in past and current administrations think that Iran's, America's Iran policy should be principally measured by how much improved or how damaged is the bilateral relationship with this Iranian regime and what can be accomplished through that relationship. I believe uh, this approach, which has been tried periodically over the past 20 years or so when in vogue, has not advanced U.S. policy aims over the past few decades, nor has it seemed to help the cause of freedom and prosperity in Iran. Now, this is not to say that Iran is just a security problem for the U.S. with military solutions. The relationship, the region, and what is at stake is far too complex for that. However, I put small hope in traditional diplomatic engagement or outreach to this Iranian regime. Instead, I think American energy should be spent constructing policies that are oriented on reducing Iran's strategic challenge, and that should be the focus of U.S. policy. However, let me make a non-political military point directly up front and then circle back to it in my conclusion to underscore the relationship between different elements of American power. And here's the point. There is nothing that is likely to be more decisive and more influential in reducing the strategic threats from Iran's current regime than having a vigorous democratic opposition within Iran. It should be a central goal of U.S. policy to support the democratic opposition in Iran and the U.S. should be prepared to do so with as much aid as is required and without any concessions to the Iranian regime. We've seen both before and during the Ahmadinejad presidency that we get precious little in return for appeasing the current Iranian government. Military might, strategic postures, security agreements, intelligence activities, and all those other tools of my profession aside, I'm telling you that the single most telling strategic lever we have against this Iranian regime is a well-organized and legitimate democratic opposition that has the muscular support of both the U.S. and Europe. So while I've said that I think American policy towards this Iranian regime should revolve around Iran as a security challenge on multiple fronts, I also recognize that the single best tool to ameliorate the Iranian regime's security challenges to the region and the U.S. is an empowered and well-supported democratic opposition in Iran. Now I'll come back to that point and its fundamental connection to the U.S. security issues with Iran in a bit. But first let me touch on the important strategic issues in my field. Now, it's very useful to recognize that since the end of World War II, it has been an important, if not a vital, American interest to preserve a balance of power in the Gulf. And for a number of geopolitical reasons, 
Uh, it's in the U.S. interest, I'd even argue it's in the world's interest, to not have a hegemonic power in the Gulf that would seek to crimp or control everything from energy to political expression. And when I served in government, we recognized that since the revolution in Iran, there had only been two real counterweights to Iranian pressure, hegemonic ambitions, and revolutionary export, and that was Iraq and the U.S. Saddam's Iraq, of course, brought over the course of the years its own dangerous assortment of aggression and bellicosity to the region, but Saddam as a local geopolitical counterweight to Iran for many years was not in any doubt. It's not a value judgment, it's just a fact. Now, when the U.S. removed Saddam from power in 2003, the U.S. was left as the only geopolitical counterweight to Iran. And despite the huge amount of American forces we had in the region, the notion by 2004, 2005, 2006 that the U.S. was tied down in a very tough period in Iraq, Iranian attempts to exert active military or paramilitary influence through Shiite factions in Iraq and Hezbollah in Lebanon, especially during the 2006 war, an Iranian charm offensive with its Arab neighbors, and the self-perception self of the Arab countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council of their own military weaknesses in key areas left the regional balance of power more fragile than we would have liked. Thus, we created the Gulf Security Dialogue to have a very action-oriented framework to first improve some key defensive capabilities of our allies in the region where Iran was trying to pursue some asymmetric advantage, and secondly, tie those allies closer to the U.S. in very fundamental political military ways. By doing both these things, we hope to give the, our Arab friends uh, enough confidence in their own capabilities and in their relationship with the U.S. to not buckle under Iranian pressure. And every time myself and my good friend Peter Rodman went through the region, we were always followed immediately behind us by an Iranian delegation hitting all the same capitals and all the same countries as us to counteract our message uh, that the U.S. was here to stay and would stand by its friends and they didn't need to buckle to Iranian pressure. Now, the areas of the cooperation in this program were all specifically targeted at perceived points of Iranian strength and corresponding Gulf Cooperation Council country weaknesses, and they were all oriented at areas that offered enduring close cooperation with the U.S. and that would bind these countries closer together in real operational and strategic ways. Things such as missile defense, maritime defense, air defense, counterterrorism cooperation, counterproliferation cooperation, energy security, intelligence sharing, regional military planning, and the like. Uh, we also worked on updating the U.S.'s declaratory policy in the region. Heretofore, declaratory policy in the U.S. was largely based on old-fashioned tripwires, state-centric tripwires like cross-border incursions, violation of territorial waters, and so on. But what we really needed, given where Iranian pressure was, was an updated policy that took into account less obvious, but perhaps more insidious ways of threatening a neighbor or undermining their freedom of action, nuclear bullying, terrorism, harassment, fomenting internal problems, and the like. Now, all these moves were aimed and still are. This program uh, is under the direct direction of the Secretary of Defense now, I'm happy to say. And they're still aimed at Iran, uh, attempting to counter its nuclear weapons ambitions, its efforts through Hezbollah and other means to destabilize other states in the region, and its ambition to see the U.S. quit the Gulf. And it all helped with the Iranian regime challenge, and it still does. But Iran remains an enormous strategic challenge to regional and even global stability, especially its nuclear ambitions. In fact, when looking at other problems that people say are similar, such as a nuclear North Korea, Iran, I feel, is a much bigger problem. One only need recognize that North Korea is a small and in many ways weak state surrounded by strong states, while Iran is a big and potentially powerful state surrounded by strategically weak states to appreciate this argument. If this particular Iranian regime is left unchecked, in its nuclear ambitions, unchecked in its ambitions to destabilize the region through proxy organizations unchecked, in its support for terrorism or in exporting its revolutionary theocratic fervor, then the Gulf region, and by extension the world, has a very big problem. Now, there have been some intelligent arguments put forward by friends of mine about uh, containing and living with a nuclear Iran. I disagree with these. And I fear our current policy, our current Iran policy, implicitly leads to that sort of thinking. It's the logical thing to think through. Uh, instead, for a succinct and really comprehensive view of the incredible cascade of problems that would result from a nuclear Iran, I highly recommend a piece by my friends Eric Edelman 
and Andy Krepenovich in the January and February edition of Foreign Affairs about the dangers of a nuclear Iran is one of the best pieces I've seen in quite some time. So uh, looking at this whole situation, as U.S. and even European policymakers look at all their options, they have to examine their entire kit bag of tools. And diplomatic pressure from the U.N. and the major powers, including sanctions, has had some effect, but I think we all have to recognize it has not fundamentally changed the behavior of the regime or aided regime change. Military options from the U.S. and the coalition forces in the region are very extensive, and much could be done militarily to pressure the regime well short of anything resembling an invasion or even a limited, limited incursion against Iran. However, and here is where the explicit goals of your organizations and U.S. security aims coincide, a potent democratic opposition in Iran that has the unified support of Europe and the U.S. is, is a key element perhaps the key element that should be part of American policy. <laughs> now all these elements of policy should be seen as synergistic and part and parcel of one goal, to see a free and peaceable democratic Iran replace a belligerent and militant theocracy. Now at an earlier conference of this group, Ambassador Mitchell Reese made an important point about the connectivity of efforts. He noted that if the U.S. was in the business of negotiating with Iran, supporting the opposition would give any American negotiator more leverage, not less, at the negotiating table. I would make the same point about American or coalition military options. Knowing that they are on the table and possible at any time in response to Iranian provocation should in turn strengthen the hand of the democratic opposition in Iran. A free, peaceful, and non-nuclear Iran will be able to say goodbye to military confrontations with the U.S. and its neighbors, international sanctions, and the like. And I hope that the democratic opposition in Iran can make this point known to and accepted by their supporters. Now, the U.S. and its coalition partners have a mighty military force in the Gulf region. Aircraft carriers will not win this confrontation. At the end of the day, political military arrangements in the region and even more effective diplomatic pressure or sanctions by themselves cannot bring peace to the region and certainly not freedom and prosperity to the Iranian people. They can help, but they will not get the job done alone. For that, we need forces like we saw in 2009 in Iran. And, you know, yes, there was a Persian Spring before this current Arab Spring. We need those forces to be aided, inspired, and supported as a central tenet of U.S. and European policy. Thank you very much. Thank you.